the 36th starts its journey from Earth's most embarrassing military disaster. It happened in the Null System, a dangerous, underdeveloped world centred on an expanding Sepid star. Many had been warned about the dangers of this system. The battle carrier, UES Olympus's admiral, fueled by the confidence that had been placed in the carrier's abilities to outmatch its opponents, ordered the crew to navigate the vessel too close to Ashana, the fifth planet in the system, when following a band of pirates. The result? Disaster. Olympus was caught in the gravitational pull of Ashana, and hurtled towards its surface, resulting in catastrophic wreckage and few survivors. In an incredible stroke of luck, as the ship went down, the combat air patrol aboard the Olympus managed to deploy. An invigorating hour-long battle with rebel forces ensued, with 37 space-to-space -space kills. Ultimately, the battle was in vain, and all six of the remaining UEEN fighters were lost. The last moments of Lieutenant JG Jasmine's ordeal was recorded on her vessel's black box. The pirates seized the opportunity to sell it to her family on Earth. The Naval High Command needed to do something to shift the focus from these embarrassing events, taking Lieutenant Jasmine's recordings and using them to portray the crew as martyrs. What followed was a plethora of patriotic propaganda, including a government-sponsored holovid and, more importantly, in 2579, in honour of the pilots who fought the last stand at Null, the establishment of the 36th Fighter Squadron. The 36th Fighter Squadron has become the UEE's premier active duty gladius unit, steeped in honour and bloodied from the battles against the Tavarin. This prestigious squadron remained at the centre of every major human conflict. Along with the 36th Fighter Squadron came the first production run of Gladius fighters. Prior to this, patrol units always took a back seat, but the fast and adaptable nature of the Gladius elevated it to become the UEEN's first choice for interception duties. This was aided by the squadron's ability to pass on the superior interceptor knowledge from elite veterans to the patrols of other less specialist squadrons. As the UEE continued their territorial domination, in 2582, a new system would be discovered. Located on the border of a dark nebula, the Nix system consists of three planets, largely uninhabitable due to their hazardous atmospheric condition and icy terrain. The planets orbit an F-type main sequence star discovered by solo nav jumper Carla Larry. She located Nix through a jump point in the Bremen system, and was underwhelmed by its offering, describing it as lacking significant mineral deposits or logical reason to apply the expense of terraformation. Although there is no acknowledgement from the UEE of this, Larry did try to formally name the three planets she discovered. Lou, Morgan and Ashley are reported to be a symbol to three of her romantic conquests. Whilst the planets of the Nix system didn't offer as much as other planetary system discoveries, its glacium ring asteroid belt is more appealing, especially to those seeking solace from the UEE. Small communities have established themselves on the asteroids within the ring and operate outside of UEE law, often being held responsible for many of the outlaw raids that occur within the trans synthworld shipping lanes. The asteroid field has also become known for its harbouring of those less complementary of Messer's regime. Delamar is the largest asteroid settlement in the Nix system, hidden deep inside the Glacium Ring. The People's Alliance moved into its old mining facility after it failed to turn a profit and was left abandoned. They dubbed it Levski, and turned it into a hotbed for political radicals and anti-UEE sentiment. To fully understand Levski, you must visit the hand-carved statue of Antony Tanaka, the boy whose death became a rallying cry for the anti-Messa movement, 
While there are other sculptures of Tanaka in the UEE, none are as beautifully dark and defiant. Levski's approach to political activism has meant it has become a haven for those with varied interests, held together by a sliver of commonality in their political views. We, the People's Alliance of Levski, are dedicated to the creation and continual development of a truly egalitarian community, where all sentients may feel safe and free to express ideas while supporting each other towards the communal goal of enlightened self-sufficiency. They are always open to visitors, but free from UEE rule, they ask those that do so to abide by their own code. Signs that greet all those that land on Delamar say, even if you disagree with us, you will respect our right to life. Over half a century since our first interstellar war with the Tavarian race, humanity faced a familiar threat. Unimpressed by the UEE's dominance of their homeworld Kalith and led by warlord Korath Thal, the Tavarin were intent on retaking what had now been renamed as Elysium IV. They had used the last 50 years hiding on the fringe, wisely rebuilding their forces and were poised to attack. A short time after hostiles were avowed, in 2603, the formidable 36th Fighter Squadron, eager to prove themselves, were called into the charge. Our second Tavarin War had begun. The 36th Fighter Squadron's interception skills excelled during early battles, and despite the Tavarin forces gaining an early advantage through the destruction of our capital ships, none of the warships under Gladius protection suffered a single blow. Whilst some understood the Tavarin's desire to reclaim their homeland, the UEE had to remain strong and fight for its territory. As the battle took hold for seven long years, the Tavarin, on the verge of defeat, decided to make a final stand on Elysium IV. The outcome has been immortalised in an art piece by Aaron Fring. His reflection on what drove him to create this reads. As with most art, I wasn't trying to depict the moment exactly as it was. That's what I'd always done in the past. But this was something so much more than the visual. There was so much complexity caught up in that action, from the Savarin, for what it meant for us as a species, and what it meant to me. I just wanted to try and capture the feeling of that fraction of time so beautiful and so sad. The artwork was on display in the Bentley National Gallery. An extract from Art Today reads, Before you stands as one of the most enduring images from the Second Tavarin War, from 2603 to 2610. The artist, Aaron Fring, was born on Ferron in 2578 to Max and Mary Fring, a teacher and pilot respectively. As a child, he suffered from a bout of Kilo's malady and was bedridden for over a year. During that time, he passed his time sketching. As a young man, Fring enlisted in the expeditionary forces as a field medic. He travelled to many systems before finally deciding to settle down on Elysium IV. Operating a small med station during the day, Fring took up painting again at night. He could often be found wandering the landscape for hours at a time, painting all that he saw. While he showed promise as a landscape artist, he never made much of an impression on the art community. Though he wished for more, Fring was content with his practice and his hobby. In 2603, a new Tavarin warlord, Korath Thal, emerged from the corners of Cosmos with a rebuilt Tavarin battle fleet and launched his first attack against the UPE systems. The Tavarin's sole mission was to reclaim Elysium IV, their former homeworld. The settlements on Elysium IV rushed to take up arms in defence of their homes. Fring attempted to rejoin, but the same malady that afflicted him as a child resurfaced, preventing him from doing his duty. On June 24th, 2610 Standard Earth Time, Korath Thol suffered a catastrophic defeat at the hands of Squadron 42 at 
the infamous Battle of Centauri, with his fleet rapidly falling to either destruction or surrender, Koroth Thal mustered his remaining law pilots to make a desperate charge for Elysium IV. Though they suffered an additional 70% casualty, his fleet finally reached the atmosphere of their old homeworld. Koroth Thal and his pilots lowered their thermal shields and dove for the planet. Aaron Frink had been walking that evening. His sickness had subsided a bit. He felt he had to get out and clear his head. He wandered the landscape as he had done many times before. On the crest of a hill, he saw something spectacular. The Tavarian fleet burning up in the atmosphere as they hurtled toward the ground. A political rally for the re-election of new Benzi mayor, Nadia Padwani, the Terran governor, unveiled a stunning new proposition. Dusk was just beginning to settle, and the fundraiser was making some serious progress when Assad Kieran stepped up onto the podium. Little did everyone know he was about to drop a bombshell. At approximately 5.15 local time, Hassan Kieran unveiled plans to issue a referendum to the people of Terra and the neighbouring systems to seek separation from the Imperator and the UEE. The Imperator lives in an era where alien civilizations are something to be feared. Those of us who live here, where the Banu and the Shi'an are neighbours, where we see them every day, we know that they are not the enemy. They are people, like us. Their culture may be different, their motivations may be different, but they are just trying to live, live in safety. The Imperator is happy to keep them at a distance through the sights of weapons, but I don't believe we can continue on this path. As Carson once said, if you live anticipating a war, sooner or later you shall have one. In short, I believe that Earth is increasingly disconnected from the realities of today. That is causing political and social instability in all systems. This is not a call to arms or invitation for conflict. All I'm asking is to open a dialogue. Needless to say, not many people were talking about the mayor's re-election after that. The motion for separation drafted by the infamous Terran governor, Hassan Kieran, failed to pass the public referendum today. As expected, the loyal citizens of Terra and its neighbouring systems realised that Kieran's plan for sovereignty was an ill-conceived, unrealistic idea that would lead to an unstable future for them and their children, and they made their voices heard. Going in droves to the voting stations and saying, no, we don't agree, we don't think that the UEE is failing us. One can only hope that Kieran gets the message. No matter where Hassan Kieran seems to turn, he is met by another accusation. Since proposing his motion for sovereignty six months ago, the governor has battled accusations ranging from infidelity to drug addiction to corruption. The governor released a statement earlier today to all the news orgs. These allegations are baseless in the extreme and are simply trying to distract from the real issue. The Imperator and his minions have mangled the processes of government by ignoring the clear will of the people to emancipate themselves from a corrupt and vile government. Kieran explained that he's obtained evidence of voter tampering and outright fraud by employees on UEE payroll. This evidence has been entered into the court system and would be part of his ongoing federal case against Imperator Messer III. The enemy is among us. Early this morning, advocacy agents announced the resolution of a massive inner agency undercover operation into the shadowy world of traitors and saboteurs. Dozens of arrests have been made, with more on the horizon. Unnamed sources from within the government claim that Xi'an funded terrorists had infiltrated various positions in government and core structures. While we are awaiting an official statement 
we have confirmed through multiple sources that the former governor of Terra, Asan Kieran, might be implicated. The same governor, if you remember, who disappeared after the good citizens ran him out of office, after his desperate and paranoid attempts to bring disorder and anarchy to the systems. It's fair to say that Gold Horizon have been a driving force in enabling trillions of humans to make new worlds their home. We were destined to expand to the stars, and they were the reason our worlds had been brought closer together than we ever thought possible. Without their intervention, our empire wouldn't be as strong as it was. Why the Gold Horizon CEO, Dennis Acevedo, made the decision to move its headquarters to Terra remains unknown. Some say it was to reduce overheads, others that it was a protest to the aggressive expansion of the Empire. What we do know is that Corson and Mesa, the UEE's Imperator, felt that the cultural focus had already shifted too far from Earth, and did not take kindly to this decision. Contracts dried up, and developers were told not to buy their equipment from Gold Horizon. The final blow came in 2654 when the government nationalised all terraforming support. Gold Horizon space platforms were now nationalised. The financial struggles faced by Gold Horizon led the government to claim that it was to protect the citizen settlers who would rely on them while laying claim to the new worlds. Gold Horizon ultimately found their assets frozen and despite the efforts of two CEOs shifting their business model back to its mining origins, the efforts were in vain. The good fortune afforded to Gold Horizon ceased, and in 2655, Gold Horizon would be out of business. The fuel gauge was running low. They couldn't go much further without collecting more hydrogen. The long-range UAE destroyer squadron made the decision to make their way to Orion, an uncharted star system in the eastern edge of the galaxy. There, they were able to harvest hydrogen from the atmosphere of the seventh planet in the system. In all, they spent longer than they intended in the system, taking the opportunity to produce never-before-seen star maps of the area. Whilst seven planets orbited this system, only the third planet, Orion, has been identified to be habitable. Orion 3, or Armitage as it was named by the explorers, was not a place that offered much excitement. It was quite an ordinary place, with no use for jump points and few known natural resources that could be mined. For the next 20 years, Orion slipped to the back of the UEE's agenda. That was until Orion became a surprising choice for the UEE's Project Farstar initiative. Keen to rejuvenate the notion of reaching out for the galaxy, this project was fuelled not only by a practical need for new settlements, but by the desire to make history. The goal was to build the most distant human colony possible, and Armitage soon became a thriving metropolis. Its thrust into the spotlight brought with it a great deal of attention, leading to the colonists spending more time exploring its offerings. Surprisingly, they discovered it wasn't as ordinary as first believed. Hiding just out of sight in the planet's asteroid belt lay precious minerals and resources, mainly gold and platinum. In addition to this, Armitage was scouted as a future hub for the production of food to provide to nearby systems as Farstar's expansion continued. Modular farms began to take hold, and the future started to look bright. <laughs> 